All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to IR Talks uh, for April 13. Today, we have the distinct, distinct honor to welcome Dr. Ulrich Kuhn from IFSH Hamburg. Allow me to, uh, give, to provide a very short introduction. Dr. Kuhn is the head of arms control and emerging technologies at the Institute for Peace Research and Security Policy at the University of Hamburg. He's also a non-resident scholar of the nuclear policy program uh, within the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and a founder and mem permanent member of the Trilateral Deep Cuts Commission. He previously worked for the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation, the Helmut Schmidt University, and the Federal Foreign Office in Germany. From 2016 to 2017, Dr. Kuhn was a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace he is an alumnus of the Zeit Foundation, Ebelin and Gert Bucerius. His research focuses on arms control and non-proliferation mechanisms, nuclear and conventional deterrence, Euro-Atlantic and European security, and international security institutions. He has published over 100 articles on arms control and non-proliferation, international security institutions, and transatlantic security, and three books. His latest, the Rise and Fall of Cooperative Arms Control in Europe was published in 2020. And we strongly encourage you to uh, read it and to purchase it and read it. For today, the topic of his talk, or I should say the title of his talk, is Choosing the U.S. Nuclear Umbrella, Counterproductive Consequences of Germany's Love for the Status Quo, which is going to be a chapter for an edited, edited volume that um, I also have the pleasure of joining. and. We are really looking forward to hearing more about the research you've done for this um, for this initiative. Dr. Kuhn, the floor is yours. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you, Professor George, uh, for inviting me today to this uh, talk. Uh, if you have problems hearing me, uh, just say it. Uh, I'm trying to keep the microphone as close as possible to my mouth, but uh, please do interrupt me if you cannot hear me uh, properly. Um, the lecture that I will be giving today is, as uh, Eliza George just referred to, based on a manuscript that I'm currently writing for an edited volume on so-called counterproductive nuclear choices, meaning such policies that lead, perhaps inadvertently, to the opposite outcome of a desired policy goal. Um, now, let me give you just one example, uh, one recent example. Uh, the Trump administration, uh, as we all know, aimed to prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons by leaving the uh, Iran deal, better known as the JCPOA. However, as it turned out, uh, and as most analysts had already predicted, that policy actually led Iran to increase its efforts and to move closer to being able to produce a nuclear weapon. So the policy of the Trump administration somewhat backfired, and that is exactly the title of this volume. It's called Nuclear Backfires. And hopefully the volume will come out sometime in 2020 at Harvard University Press. But well, some of you may have contributed already to edited volumes. It usually takes longer um, than you imagine uh, in the first place. Now. My lecture today will not focus so much on Trump, but it will focus on a number of nuclear choices or to be more precise, nuclear non-choices that Germany, that is my home country, made or did not make during the last four years. And those were the Trump years. The main point that I'm going to develop is that German leaders are in love with the status quo. And their love with the status quo has produced a number of counterproductive consequences in international affairs and particularly in the nuclear realm. The possible pains that come with these counterproductive consequences, I would argue, can already be felt in Berlin. However, they are not yet acute enough for Germany to change its policy and to divert from the status quo. I know that this was rather abstract, so speaking perhaps a bit more in plain terms, Germany wants to keep the status quo of the US providing extended nuclear deterrence, while at the same time hoping that Washington will also show more flexibility and commitment when it comes to nuclear arms control with Russia. 
but the current trends are pointing towards the opposite. Washington is less interested in nuclear and also conventional arms control with Russia. And the four years of Trump have also shown that a certain strand of the US policy establishment is willing to make America's security guarantees to European allies via the NATO alliance conditional on the fulfillment of certain political demands. So far, Germany has not decided to draw consequences from these trends. Instead, Germany was waiting out the Trump administration and hoped that things would get better under the new administration of Joe Biden. Now, this all is interesting in as much as there had been opportunities for Germany to shift its policies on nuclear deterrence and nuclear and conventional arms control and disarmament during the four Trump years. But Berlin did not make use of any of those opportunities. And I will, of course, tell you in a bit what those opportunities were. Now, whether that choice was wise cannot be judged right now, but what we can see is that not making use of any of those opportunities created costs that can already be felt in Berlin. Let me start with a look back at what I call the grand profiteer of post-Cold War stability in Europe, and by that I mean Germany. The end of the Cold War did bring a number of massive gains for the country. First, Germany's main domestic as well as international policy goal, and that was always the reunification of the German nation state, was achieved, and it was achieved in a peaceful and cooperative manner. Second, Germany's other main foreign policy goal, the peaceful integration of Europe in the form of the European Union, gained speed, and Germany, perhaps more unintentional than by deliberate design, became Europe's imminent economic and political powerhouse. Third, with the collapse of the Warsaw Pact in the Soviet Union, the main threat to Central Europe, as was experienced during the Cold War, disappeared almost literally overnight. As a consequence, Germany, as a bon mot headed at that time, was surrounded only by friends. Now, that result was also made possible by two trends in the nuclear realm that accompanied the end of the Cold War. First, the United States, after having won the Cold War, did not decide to retreat from Europe or to dissolve the North Atlantic Pact, even though at that time there were voices that were pushing for an opposite decision. Instead, Washington kept NATO but it adapted its core mission, meaning it started to integrate new members, mostly from the former Warsaw Pact states, and it massively scaled back its nuclear deterrence commitments, simply for the reason that nuclear deterrence in the post-Cold War environment did not justify anymore the deployment of thousands of nuclear warheads in Europe. Washington also kept in place one of the key ingredients of extended nuclear deterrence, which is the principle of nuclear sharing. Accordingly, US nuclear gravity bombs are still stored in some European states, where those states' national air forces, in the event of a crisis or a war, would deliver those weapons. Germany is among those states, and so is Turkey. For those in Germany that value the transatlantic relationship with the US, those weapons became somewhat of a symbol of the unchanged security commitment of America to its German and European allies. Even if the military need for deterrence was low, those weapons symbolized commitment, even friendship, and perhaps somewhat of an ultimate, though improbable, hedge. While the need for deterrence was low, the second trend of those years was that the interest in arms control and disarmament in Washington and Moscow was actually high. Accompanying the end of the Cold War, a number of legally binding treaties of informal agreements and international organizations in the realm of arms control came into being. Let me just recall a couple of those. Among the most important ones were the INF Treaty, that is the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which banned all land-based missiles with ranges between 500 and 5,500 kilometers of the US and the Soviet Union. 
the START agreements, reducing the number of strategic US and Russian nuclear weapons, the Conventional Armed Forces in Europe or CFE Treaty, which massively cut back conventional weaponry of the two blocks in five conventional weapons categories, and the Open Skies Treaty, a transparency and verification regime between the two blocks that allowed for cooperative overflights of each other's territories, particularly in order to monitor troops movements or to make sure that states are in compliance with their arms control stipulations. <clears throat> now taken together, these two trends, low need for nuclear and conventional deterrence, high interest in nuclear and conventional arms control, allowed the reunified Germany to reap the so-called peace dividend, meaning Germany cut back massively its military spending, it reduced its armed forces, and it spent the money on other things, first and foremost on the costs of integrating East Germany and modernizing East Germany's eroding infrastructure, which cost the German taxpayers billions and billions of uh, Deutschmark and still today euros. The last couple of years now have seen a shift and then increasingly a reversal of those two trends. The first reversal happened in the realm of arms control. Remember the so-called unipolar moment? With the, uni with the unipolar moment and the attacks of 9-11, Washington's interest in arms control with Russia waned. As a somewhat delayed consequence, also Russia's interest in arms control with the US declined. Accordingly, a chain of events unfolded and ultimately gained speed during the last four years. In 2002, the US withdrew from the Cold War Pact of the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. The very same year, Washington also decided not to ratify an updated version of the CFE Treaty. In 2007, Russia suspended the CFE Treaty. In 2014, the US publicly accused Russia of, secretary, secret, sorry, of secretly developing a new ground-launched cruise missile in the forbidden ranges of the INF Treaty. In 2019, America withdrew finally from the INF Treaty, and the same year Russia followed suit. Then, in 2020, the US announced to withdraw from the Open Skies Treaty. Russia, meanwhile, has reserved the right to do the same, which many analysts, including uh, colleagues here in Hamburg, expect to happen this year. Now you see the tit for tat behavior that's going on here since 20 years. And the last agreement that we still have that's still standing is the New START Treaty, which some of you might have followed was extended by both sides in February this year in a last ditch effort before the agreement was running out. And it's no big secret to say that if we wouldn't have had the Biden administration, the Trump administration would have probably um, just let also that treaty die. The second trend reversal happened in the realm of deterrence. In 2008, Russia and Georgia entered a short eight days war, which also alerted NATO's easternmost allies. Six years later, Russia annexed Crimea and became involved in the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Shortly thereafter, Russia entered the civil war in Syria on the side of the Assad regime. Accompanying these developments, outsized military maneuvers and regular incursions into or close to NATO airspace and military close calls in the air and on the sea became the unfortunate new normal. In addition, Russian intelligence assets were involved in the use of chemical weapons in the poisoning of Sergei Skripal and Alexei Navalny. In 2016, NATO allies finally decided to enhance their conventional deterrence commitments to the three Baltic states and Poland. And the latest version of the US nuclear posture review devised the additional deployment of a new generation of tactical nuclear weapons on US submarines with the explicitly stated goal of countering Russian attempts to lower the threshold for nuclear use. Meanwhile, NATO allies are also debating how to counter the alleged Russian INF violation, either by deploying new, I, new uh, US missiles to Europe or by adding missile defense systems. For NATO, deterrence is back 
and it's back big time. And I would say it doesn't look like it is going away anytime soon. Now taken together, today we now have a high need for nuclear and conventional deterrence in the European context and a low interest in nuclear and conventional arms control in Washington and Moscow. Accompanying the higher need for deterrence in the European context was what I would call a political undercurrent, which turned out to be the most important one when debating European security. Since at least the first term of the Obama administration, America is trying to pivot away from Europe and towards Asia. One could even argue that already the global war on terror under George W. Bush was already somewhat of a pivot away from the European theater. Now, while the need for deterrence in Europe had gone up since 2014, China's rise or its re-emergence historically seen this time now as a global competitor to the US had forced Washington to continue pivoting to the Asian theater at the same time. Now, in order to shoulder both tasks, meaning keeping the commitments to Europe and also um, uh, dealing with China as a new competitor, the US administration started to demand from its European allies to pay more for their own security. And this is where the now famous 2% goal of NATO comes from, meaning that NATO allies agreed to spend at least 2% of their national GDP on defense. Exacerbating this trend, the Trump administration went even further and made the US security guarantee conditional on European allies paying what the Trump administration called their fair share. In all fairness, this conditionality was established only implicitly and mostly rhetorically, and it never, be, it never became official US policy. However, some of the more concrete threats that Trump had uttered, in particular towards Germany, would have only materialized had he been elected for a second term. For Germany, these trend reversals created a dilemma. On the one hand, Berlin has a continued interest in arms control in the European context, because arms control is a proven low cost measure to ensure mutual regional security. It's clearly easier and cheaper to uphold, let's say the provisions of the CFE treaty and verify that states have only limited regional capabilities to conduct conventional surprise attacks than investing in conventional military assets to ensure regional deterrence by denial by their own forces. The problem is that a number of key players in Europe have no real interest in arms control in the European context anymore, meaning Russia, the United States, and NATO allies east and often north of Germany. On the other hand, Germany has also a continued interest in the European integration project moving forward, meaning Berlin is interested in making sure its European allies within the EU and NATO are feeling safe and secure, and that no serious outside threat impinges on their security. Because as long as those countries are explicitly safe, implicitly, so is Germany. The potential costs of the European integration project unraveling due to security concerns would be outsized from a German perspective. Thus, Germany has to take the security interests of its Eastern and Northern allies serious. And that means that Berlin has to back up certain NATO deterrence policies directed against Russia, which at the same time might make it politically more difficult to re-engage with Russia on arms control. It also means that Germany has to keep the American patron happy and engaged in European security affairs. Because if America were to disengage from Europe, the costs for Berlin would be immediate and massive. It would mean that Germany, together with other European league nations, would have to fill the military boots that the US would be leaving behind in Europe. And that is something I can tell you that German politicians want to avoid at almost all costs. 
Now, how did German policymakers react to this new and complex environment? And let's keep in mind that these trends started to unfold before the Trump administration. First, German policymakers started to push a new security trope under the headline of more responsibility. It was former German president Joachim Gauck who declared at the 50th Munich Security Conference back in 2014 that, I quote, Germany must be ready to do more to guarantee the security that others have provided it with for decades, end of quote. Other key German political figures echoed that sentiment in the years to follow. But aside from Germany contributing roughly 1,100 soldiers to Lithuania as part of the 2016 enhanced forward presence of NATO in response to calls from the Baltic states for enhanced deterrence, honestly, not much happened. Today, Germany is still far away from NATO's 2% spending goal. And many decisions in the German parliament do not seem to indicate that Germany wants, again, the quote, to guarantee the security that others have provided it with for decades, also by increased military means. I think today one can rightfully conclude that the pledge of more responsibility was an empty one. Now, fast forward to the year 2020. German policymakers, secondly, rebuffed French President Emmanuel Macron's calls for what Macron called a Europe that protects. That is a formula that increasingly developed into the so-called European strategic autonomy debate. In a nutshell, the latter one simply refers to Europe, meaning the EU, having the capabilities, including the military capabilities, to defend itself if necessary. The background to this debate was, of course, the election of Donald Trump and his policy of America first, which often also meant Europe second or perhaps even Europe last. Now, back in 2017, even Angela Merkel had remarked that, I quote, the days when Europe could rely on others were over to a certain extent. According to Merkel, we Europeans really have to take our fate into our own hand, end of quote. Of course, given that the origin of the idea of European strategic autonomy was French, part of the concept was always that it would be France that would act as a political and military leader in a strategically autonomous Europe. And of course, from a French perspective, autonomy would have to have a nuclear component. Thus, in his first speech on nuclear affairs in February 2020, French President Macron invited France's European partners, which are ready for it, as, as he said, to a strategic dialogue, I quote, on the role played by France's nuclear deterrence in our collective security. And the quote goes on, European partners which are willing to walk that road can be associated with the exercises of French deterrence forces. This strategic dialogue and these exchanges will naturally contribute to developing a, a true strategic culture among Europeans." End of quote. And for those of you that had a bit of experience uh, or exposure to French nuclear strategy and French strategic documents, you will recognize that this is uh, a pretty open and almost blunt language because uh, uh, the, the French language on nuclear issues is uh, oftentimes uh, very vague. Now, the German response to that offer could not have been more underwhelming, I would say. No important German political figure took up the offer or even responded directly to Macron's suggestion, at least not publicly. The German defense minister, Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer, who at some point was even um, uh, traded as the next German chancellor, even wrote in an op-ed in Politico that, I quote, illusions of European strategic autonomy must come to an end. Europeans will not be able to replace America's crucial role as a security provider. For the US, this means 
that it needs to keep Europe under its nuclear umbrella for the foreseeable future, end of quote. Well, I would say one cannot be more brutal when turning down what can be read as a tentative French opening for discussions uh, on an alternative nuclear arrangement for Europe. Third area where German policymakers reacted. German policymakers went to great length not to anger the American patron on issues of arms control and disarmament, even though alternative pathways and options had opened up in that realm as well. Let me give you two examples. First, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons or TPNW. Perhaps you have heard that during recent years, the international community um, had developed a new political process that originally only focused on the humanitarian effects of nuclear weapons. Now that process soon developed into what is now officially since early 2021, a legally binding international agreement called the TPNW or short ban treaty. No big surprise here for the nuclear weapon states that treaty is a red flag since it aims to outlaw nuclear arms entirely. It is also no big surprise that the US secretly or not so secretly nudged its allies not to come too close to that treaty. Even though Germany is since decades a staunch supporter of multilateral international frameworks in general and of nuclear disarmament in particular, it remained absent from the TPNW negotiations. Germany will also not join the new treaty anytime soon, and German officials are having a hard time even coming up with some form of constructive engagement beyond simply ignoring the new instrument. The second example from the realm of arms control is the Open Skies Treaty. One of those regimes I already had referred to at the beginning that was established in conjunction with the end of the Cold War. There is no doubt amongst experts and officials that Open Skies had and continues to have a direct positive impact on European security, meaning we still need that treaty. Now, last year, the Trump administration, which I think one could honestly say is generally or was generally very skeptical of arms control, decided to leave the agreements on rather questionable grounds of allegations of Russian misconduct. Or let's put it that way, there were clearly ways to solve those issues with the Russians uh, had the US invested the necessary time and effort. Germany, as almost all NATO allies, was strictly opposed to that US decision. Without US participation in the treaty, Russia, who is already a key party to open skies would have almost no reason to stay. But Moscow did signal to the other open skies participating states, including to Germany, that it could imagine staying in the treaty if treaty data taken from overflights over its Russian territory by other participants would not be shared further with any non-treaty parties. So in a nutshell, what Moscow meant was US allies must not share treaty data with the US anymore. And to make that request more pressing, Moscow demanded an official written confirmation from US allies. Otherwise, it threatened it would leave the regime as well, and then the treaty would be dead. In a nutshell, Russia was playing the old game of divide and conquer. Now, Germany had a keen interest in saving the open skies regime but it also had a strong interest in not publicly questioning the transatlantic relationship, which was already in a very bad state due to the Trump administration. Thus, Germany decided against the Russian demand in the hope that a new US administration under Joe Biden would perhaps reverse the Trump decision on open skies and that everything would get back to normal, meaning going back to the status quo ante. Now, how did those three political decisions on, first, the French nuclear offer, on second, the TPNW, and on third, the Open Skies Treaty backfire? That is, in what ways did they lead to counterproductive outcomes? First, 
at a time where the future of America's security guarantees to Europe seems more and more a pawn in US partisan battles, Germany is now further away from its once closest European ally, and that is France, than ever, and particularly on all defense issues. Having snubbed Emmanuel Macron and not responded to the French nuclear offer has left French officials deeply disappointed. In a response to Kamp Karrenbauer's article in Politico, Macron said, this is a misinterpretation of history. Now at a time where Germany together with France and Spain is also planning to develop a sixth generation fighter aircraft due to become operational in the 2040s, such a signal from Berlin is seen in Paris as Germany not being able to correctly read and interpret the geopolitical writings on the wall. Second, deciding against a constructive engagement with the TPNW alienates Germany from the broad coalition of states, usually from the global south, that typically support international nuclear disarmament initiatives. Therewith, it also somewhat erodes over time Germany's role of an internationally respected champion of nuclear disarmament. In a wider sense, one could argue it chips away at Germany's international reputation as a force for good. The following years will show whether Germany will be able to find a way to engage more creatively with the TPNW. For instance, Germany could decide to attend the treaty conferences as an observer. The following years will also show how much Germany's disarmament reputation will suffer from potential and continued disengagement with the new treaty. Third, not making inroads together with Moscow and open skies and instead siding with the US did reinforce Russian perceptions of what Dmitry Training called Germany being controlled by the United States. That is what Dmitry Trenin wrote only uh, recently in an op-ed. Now, in the words of Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, that sounds a bit different, but you judge for yourself. The quote starts here. The EU, he says, has given up its claim to become one of the poles in the multipolar world order. It is totally oriented toward the US. Germany's position on many recent issues shows us that this is Berlin's desire while at the same time wanting to maintain complete leadership in the, e in the EU." End of quote. But this Russian perception, I would argue, also means that from Moscow's perspective, Europe and Germany for that matter, has no seat at the table when it comes to negotiating Europe's very own security, including perhaps in the future again by means of arms control. That table will only have two seats. One is reserved for Russia and the other one for America. Fourth, all three decisions did not reflect what a majority of Germans is actually thinking. On the TPNW, a Greenpeace poll from 2020 found that 92% of Germans want the government to sign the TPNW. On the French nuclear deterrence offer, a 2020 poll from the Munich Security Conference found that, I quote, of the 31% of Germans who believe that Germany should continue to rely on nuclear deterrence, the majority, that is 59%, believe that Germany should seek nuclear deterrence via France and the United Kingdom. Only about a quarter of those in favor of nuclear deterrence believe that Germany should continue to rely on deterrence that involves American nuclear weapons. Another poll from 2020 found that 51% of Germans agreed with the statement, Germany and Europe should become more independent from the United States. Taken together, German leaders decided deliberately to cling on to their own perception of the status quo despite a number of ongoing systemic changes. In concrete terms, German leaders decided in favor of the US nuclear alliance and the US nuclear umbrella that comes with it, 
and against a tentative alternative option from Paris. German leaders also decided to prioritize US security interests over their own arms control and disarmament objectives, again, despite having tentative alternative options. And that leaves open the question, why did German leaders embrace the status quo? First, I would argue because the costs of maintaining the transatlantic reliance, sorry, because the costs of maintaining the transatlantic alliance with the US are still comparably lower than the costs of setting up an alternative alliance and deterrence arrangement. They are particularly lower as compared to the very real costs Germany would incur would it seriously pursue a more autonomous course for Europe and back up such a course with increased German military commitments. Right now, Berlin can still somewhat free ride on America's security guarantees, even in the face of increased US pressure to spend more on defense. And by the way, that's a line of policy which did not go away under Joe Biden. Second, the benefits from such a cause are still much more tangible and still outweigh the potential benefits that might come from closer nuclear cooperation with France or closer arms control ties with Moscow or from a perhaps higher international reputation on nuclear disarmament. And in the Q&A, we can certainly talk about how serious those offers from Paris or Moscow were for that matter. Now, third, and going beyond pure cost benefit calculations, the narrative of peaceful change at the end of the Cold War, accompanied by arms control, and cooperation and safeguarded by the United States is still overwhelmingly strong in German political circles. It is particularly strong because the more recent German past was such an extraordinary success story. Now, is embracing the status quo in times of change wise, particularly when trying to gauge the uncertain future of European and German security? Well, no one knows. And of course, I also do not know. However, what seems clear is that the trends, the trends of increased great power rivalry, the trend of increased, uh, sorry, the trend of decreased cooperation between the big powers, and the trend of the US further prioritizing its Asia policy are likely to continue in the years ahead. In a world where the US might finally withdraw its focus from Europe, Germany will need two things. It will need the political and material capabilities to, Europe, to lead Europe, also on questions of security. And it will need lots of allies and partners in doing so. Right now, Germany's cause of embracing the status quo does neither prepare it materially for a world in which increased German leadership will be a necessity for Europe, nor does it help to grow sufficient trust among allies and even vis-a-vis -vis competitors that Germany is serious about its own ambitions. I thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuhn, for this fascinating presentation. Uh, I will switch back to gallery view if that's okay. I'm, I'm also going to ask our participants today, if possible, to turn their cameras on, especially when they're asking a question. Um, if they don't mind, I mean, it would be good if they could introduce themselves uh, when they um, ask a question. So please use the raise, raise hand function in, uh, in, uh, in Zoom so that you can be called upon. Um, well, while our uh, attendants today are preparing their questions, I will take the privilege of the chair to, uh, to ask my own. Um, so we are very lucky here at Bilken to have uh, some of the, um, the most uh, innovative and creative uh, IR theorists, um, world-class scholars who have worked on international security, and especially in the field of critical security studies. And from critical security studies, we know that um, there are two ways of thinking about security. One is security against, that's the traditional view. Um, and maybe uh, going along the, 
uh, the, the the lines of thought put forward by by the Aberystwyth School, we have actually we can think about security as emancipation, the freedom of, of the freedom of, of actors to to do something that they really want and being free of any constraints on them. Um, in those two conceptions, how does Germany fare? How is how is German how secure is Germany? Is Germany indeed um, has has it been emancipated? Has it been freed of constraints? Can it really pursue the, the kind of objectives it wants to pursue? Or uh, is it actually possible that the kind of commitments it has in place to preserve, to maintain its security in the traditional sense are actually uh, putting in place some sort of, I would call them golden handcuffs, for lack of a better term, uh, that are preventing Germany from from pursuing some goals. As you indicated, I, I would imagine arms control and disarmament to be one of those areas, but I'm, I'm actually just curious to see uh, how you think about these two conceptions of security. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eliza. Um, I would argue you answered your own question in the subcontext, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because already referring to uh, those two uh, uh, schools of thought, uh, the more traditional one uh, and, uh, and critical security studies, uh, not just from Everest, with, uh, points to the two poles between uh, which uh, German uh, security policy uh, is increasingly torn. Germany does want uh, to support uh, NATO. Uh, and its uh, NATO allies and its close neighbors uh, in the pursuit of security against, meaning security against uh, Russia. Um, and I would argue Germany is not doing that mainly because it feels so insecure when it comes to Russia, but it is doing this uh, because out of uh, the true belief that um, that it owes it to its Eastern uh, allies um, to um, be an ally uh, to rely on. Meaning um, allies that will openly speak out that they do feel insecure um, will always uh, get an open ear in Berlin. Um, at the same time, Germany is still uh, increased in uh, security, as you referred it uh, to as security as freedom of actors to pursue alternative causes, uh, for instance, in the realm of arms control. And I tried to point out that particularly the historical memory on the German side when it comes to arms control is still strong. It's not as strong anymore as it was 20 or 25 years ago, but it's still there. It's particularly there in the more left-leaning uh, German parties in the, uh, amongst the Social Democrats, the Green Party or uh, the parliamentarian left. Um, and that means that uh, Germany wants to also pursue arms control policies with Russia. But these two different objectives are blocking each other increasingly the more that uh, uh, the US and Russia have no interest anymore in arms control and the more that those two actors are moving towards uh, security against conceptions. Now, to answer your last question, how secure is Germany? Of course, depends on how you define security and, and what areas we're talking about, but I will try to limit myself to the more classical military realm here. Uh, I would argue that most uh, German politicians will tell you that they feel uh, rather secure. Um, in a closed door meeting, they would also tell you that they don't share the insecurity concerns of most uh, allies uh, east of Germany, um, but that will not prevent them from publicly taking those insecurity concerns uh, seriously and uh, treat them uh, with measures uh, via, uh, particularly via NATO. Um, so in that regard, I would say Germany is still rather secure. The question is, will that change in the future? And are German and are Germany's current policies designed uh, to, to actually keep that state? Or are they somewhat outdated? And those are questions that I try to point at uh, in my talk today. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a follow up, but I'm going to um, 
maybe ask that a little bit later. I, I think uh, I should we should let um, those in attendance to to ask their own questions as well. So we have uh, Volkan Imamolu, who is a PhD student uh, in our department. Volkan, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation and lecture. Uh, I want to ask that uh, you want, you mentioned that you know the cost of st maintaining uh, status quo is uh, less for right now for Germany, uh, but <clears throat> you also mentioned that the Biden administration continues the Trump administration policies, so there was no change. Do you expect to, to for for right now it's reasonable to maintain in the status quo, but uh, in the oncoming years do you expect a shift? if uh, the policies of the United States under Biden administration uh, accelerates in terms of you know, this arms uh, control. Thank you so much for your question. So yes, um, right now the costs uh, of keeping the status quo and there with keeping the US uh, nuclear umbrella, which is kind of a catch-all term to refer to the transatlantic alliance um, are comparably lower than to say it plainly to try something new. And German politicians are not very bold when it comes to trying something new usually. Um, but the first disappointment happened already this year when German policymakers realized uh, in areas that are not related to arms control, that uh, America first has not gone away. Uh, what I hear from, uh, from diplomats in Berlin is that um, the, the tone has changed when engaging uh, with the US counterparts, um, but not the substance has changed. So America first, when it comes, for instance, uh, to Corona vaccines is still America first. Um, America first when it comes to selling uh, liquid natural gas and preventing the Nord Stream pipeline um, is still America first. Uh, in that regard, I don't expect much to happen. And I also think that the German uh, wish or hope that the status quo ante would be reached when it comes to open skies, meaning that the US would re-enter the treaty and everything would get back to normal will also not materialize. So open skies, in my understanding, um, will be gone by the end of this year. And that will lead to a, a number of dissatisfactions. But in terms of costs and benefits, not much will change in that regard. Uh, I think the big change might come in four or eight years. And uh, Angela Merkel has already referred to that the big takeaway that she took from the recent elections in the US um, was not that uh, Joe Biden was elected, but that Donald Trump actually gained, I think, 4 million votes. And that is something that um, those German policymakers that are looking further towards the future uh, are keeping in mind um, when it comes to how to assess um, the, uh, the American ally. However, so far, I don't see any indications that these assessments have led or will lead in the near future uh, to um, policy changes at the nuclear level. But perhaps that might change in a couple of years. I have referred uh, to, uh, to a joint uh, fighter project uh, between France, Spain, and Germany, which is called the FCAS system, the Future Combat Air System, which as the French obviously want will be a nuclear system. Um, we will see how that, um, uh, how that project develops in the years ahead. At the moment, there are a lot of many question marks behind it, which is also uh, due to uh, financial costs and who is responsible for what in the project. Thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, question comes from Stepan Verhovitz. Please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Georg. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kunt, for your, uh, for your presentation. It was very interesting, very thought provoking. I would like to ask you, uh, what do you think um, will the, the uh, federal election in Germany somehow change the, this preference of the status quo uh, towards uh, what, what, you are, what you were talking about. 
or uh, this preference of status quo will remain even after the uh, change in the uh, in the Buddha Bundestag. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. Um, so the elections are due in September this year. Um, for those of you that uh, that have perhaps a little bit of interest in German domestic politics or that see this as a new area. Uh, of uh, intellectual engagement. Um, I can tell you those will be the most uh, interesting uh, German elections that we had since, since decades, because it's really not clear at the moment which party uh, will be the one uh, to have the next German chancellor, who will be the next German chancellor, from what party. At the moment, I can think of at least five candidates from uh, four different parties that I think could be the next German chancellor. So in particular, it will be interesting to see what the role of the German Greens will be here. Um, the, the German Greens um, have uh, historically been the most anti-nuclear party in Germany. So the, the founding myth of the Green Party uh, uh, is actually the, are the protests at the end of the 1970s and the beginning of the early 1980s against the NATO dual track decision. This is what, uh, this is kind of like the, the, the rally around the flag effect that the Greens have when talking about their past. But of course, the politicians that we see today uh, that, are leaving, that are leading the Green Party are a totally different generation. They don't have those historical memories uh, they cannot relate to that uh, uh, founding myth uh, as strongly anymore as their predecessors. And their founding myth is more the peaceful integration of Europe, meaning doing everything to keep Europe together and not just Europe, but a democratic and free Europe where the rule of law and human rights are accepted. And that puts them in a natural opposition to Russia because the Russian state under Vladimir Putin presents exactly the opposite uh, of what uh, the current generation of green politicians believes in, particularly when it comes to foreign policy. So I would argue that in whatever capacity the Greens will be in the next German um, uh, uh, government, maybe in a coalition as the junior partner, perhaps in a coalition uh, uh, with them uh, having the chancellor, um, and that could be uh, at the moment uh, either uh, a man, uh, Robert Habeck, or a woman, Annalena Baerbock, and there are only six days left until they will reveal, a bit like Christmas, which one of the two will become the chancellor candidate running for office. Um, so I would argue whoever, be, whatever role the Greens play, not much will change right now in the immediate next two years as regards Germany's transatlantic orientation. I would even go as far as to predict that the, that the Greens will swallow the bitter pill of nuclear weapons still being deployed in Germany under the nuclear sharing arrangement. That is something that a large part of the Green Party dislikes and would like to change. They want the bombs gone and not just in a few days, but today at best. And uh, this is something where we will see a lot of infighting within the Green Party. But my general prediction is the Greens will be quite staunch supporters of the transatlantic alliance, particularly now that we have again a US president that uh, has a clear foundation in democratic values and is not uh, um, uh, uh, attracted uh, by autocrats and anti-democrats like Donald Trump was. Thank you very much. Um, Sanem Topal, please go ahead. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, can you a bit more elaborate on German perspective to the Iranian nuclear program? And do you think the sanctions on them are successful or not? Thank you. Sure. So the German perspective on the Iranian nuclear issue, honestly, I thought whether I include that um, example in my, uh, in my lecture today, um, but I did not. 
for a simple reason, uh, Sanan, because I'm not an expert on it. So what I will be saying is perhaps not the most elaborate that you have heard, but I will try my best. Uh, Germany is extremely proud of the role that the E3, the three European countries plus the European uh, Union played in negotiating um, uh, the Iran nuclear deal in the first place. And from exchanges with diplomats in Brussels, I know that particularly at the beginning, the role of the EU was uh, pivotal um, in bringing together Americans and uh, Iranians uh, at the table and to kind of um, uh, uh, scale back uh, the demands that uh, particularly the US had at the beginning. Now, seeing the Trump administration doing almost everything to derail and destroy that agreement angered many, many people in Berlin and in Paris. Uh, and I would argue also in London, even though the UK uh, always insists that it has this very close and special relationship with the United States. Um, now, I think that most German diplomats were hoping that uh, the Biden administration would be more conciliatory towards Iran. When it comes to re when it comes to agreeing on the terms and conditions on how to perhaps re-enter uh, the agreement on the side of the U.S., but again, there is also quite some disappointment about how strongly the U.S. insists on certain policies and make things conditional uh, for them to re-enter the agreement. So there is quite some, I would say. Um, uh, sobering effect here in German diplomacy when it comes to the role that uh, US uh, diplomacy is playing as regards the Iran nuclear deal. And as uh, regards the sanctions, well, from sanctions research, we know that sanctions rarely work, um, that they need to be really specifically tailored. Uh, there is no one size fits all approach. And uh, if you look at the databases that are around, you see a massive increase in the use of sanctions worldwide during the last 20 to 30 years, and particularly by the United States. So my personal viewpoint is I do not see the sanctions as a tool uh, to achieve in the end what uh, um, the other parties to the agreement want from Iran. Uh, but I think that this, uh, the same could be said about uh, other um, political um, conflicts. Uh, let's say, for instance, uh, Russia's involvement in the war in eastern Ukraine, where I also don't see the sanctions imposed by the European Union um, as a leading to an outcome. Because oftentimes it's also the problem that you need to connect a clear goal uh, policy goal to your sanctions. That is, you need to communicate to the other side, what is it that you want to achieve? And what is it that reasonably the other side can change so that you at a clearly defined point can take back your sanctions? And oftentimes that's not done by policymakers. And then sanctions are simply a blunt tool. Thank you very much. Uh, Ali Arslan. Um, hello. I want to first thank uh, you for this uh, great talk. Uh, I have a class in a few minutes, so I will keep my question really short. Um, so I understood the policies of Germany and the United States and Russia. But uh, what should we expect as the next move of the uh, unsatisfied status quo state, uh, I mean the French. What should we expect as the next French move, uh, given that Germany uh, seems as an unreliable partner against balancing the Russian threat, and given that uh, United States is also uh, an unreliable partner? What should we expect as the next French move? So one thing we have to be careful, and I hope I, I made that point clear in my in my lecture, is that predictions, uh, particularly by IR scholars, are almost uh, worth uh, not the penny. Um, it's 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 rare that I read pieces uh, twenty years later and think, oh my god, he or she was so right on what he or she predicted. Uh, so a, a wonderful piece when it comes to Germany and nuclear weapons comes from John Mearsheimer. 
Um, uh, Eliza can probably help me when that piece was published, I think 1992 or 1993 in, uh, uh, in international security or international affairs. Anyways, I, I, I think it was something like um, uh, instability uh, uh, in Europe and Germany getting nuclear weapons and rah, rah, rah. Um, so having said that, uh, the next French move, well, clearly from a French perspective, um, when we talk about the rather confined um, policy topic and research topic of uh, nuclear policies, uh, there are not that many options. So one option is, of course, that uh, the French uh, simply continue the cause uh, that uh, they are uh, on right now, which means um, they are their standalone nuclear power. Uh, they have a, a, a posture and, uh, and doctrine that is clearly tailored towards only one country and towards only one person, that is France and the French president, and that they will make uh, uh, continued rhetorical references that this French deterrence has to be seen in the European context, which kind of like... Um, gives uh, a certain notion to other European states that whatever happens, for instance, to um, other EU allies um, will not be ignored by the French president and that US nuclear weapons do play a role uh, in certain contingencies. The second thing that I think we already saw um, is that France, since a couple of years, is seeking closer cooperation uh, with the UK. And that will continue despite uh, Great Britain uh, leaving the European Union. Um, I'm actually quite curious to see how France will react in the next couple of months uh, and years, if at all, uh, to the latest uh, UK decision to raise the limit of deployed nuclear warheads. Uh, uh, on its submarines. Um, and the last move then pertains to Germany. As I said, France, Germany, and Spain are planning together a multi-billion hyper-modern equipped with drones and cloud and whatnot autonomous fighter jet system that perhaps might fly in the 2040s or even only uh, in the 2050s. For Paris, a lot will depend on how the next German government supports that project. Will it continue its support? Will it strengthen its support? What about uh, exchanging um, uh, design secrets uh, from the German side when it comes to software technology, but also from the French side when it comes to designing the fighter jet? Uh, that is not clear to me at all at the moment, but I think in terms of defense and when it comes to the nuclear portfolio, the FCAS system, the FCAS system, um, follow that closely because that will be either the deal maker or the deal breaker when it comes to French-German uh, relations. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kuhn. So I don't see any hands up at the moment, uh, but you did sort of uh, put a little bit of a ball in my court by uh, talking about uh, how political scientists get their predictions wrong. And I think you're absolutely right that this is a, a tough business to be in and, and prediction maybe should not be, uh, or there should be more accountability, uh, I guess one could say. But just to uh, quickly go back to the article we were referring to called Back to the Future published in 1990, the prediction there was that if the, if the US withdraws from Europe, there should be um, uh, that, that, that there should be some limited nuclear proliferation in Europe. And, and Germany uh, would be the obvious candidate there. It had the experience, it had the capacity. Uh, and if Germany secures such a deterrent, then Europe would be more stable. Um, I'm just curious to know if, I, I know these debates in Germany, um, and you've been following them and, and there is sort of an ebb and flow and there are a lot of people who want to make a big deal out of this because uh, it makes things, it spices things up, so to say. But um, assuming the US really uh, puts Europe last, as you said during your talk, and uh, nothing happens with France, 
do you think those voices in Germany will gain more traction or do you believe this would never, ever, ever happen? Uh, there would be no serious discussion and no attempt for, for Germany to secure, to obtain an independent deterrent. There were quite a lot of ifs in, in, in the question. <laughs> so, uh, so let's recall. So if the US withdraws its security guarantees from Europe and NATO, I would say in that world, probably NATO also would dissolve. If the French-German relationship does not allow for any form of cooperation, First of all, of course, you would have discussions in Germany about that topic. That's natural. We already had um, a short flurry um, of uh, discussions, but mainly by think tankers and analysts and, and, and media figures um, directly in relation uh, to uh, the election of Donald Trump. When quite a few people were um, going out saying, uh, yeah, we need to talk uh, about nuclear options and we also need to talk about German nuclear options. Um, so that has luckily totally gone away. I don't see it coming back in the next couple of years. Um, I still believe that the first if would never be one if that is so decisive that the US entirely leaves its uh, alliance system in Europe. Um, I think that even uh, Republicans or those ones that are more leaning towards a certain form of retrenchment of the US still understand the value, or at least parts of the value of having this global network of alliances. Um, and then again, um, the German-French relations have seen lots of ups and downs over um, the last 60, 70 years. Um, we have seen uh, French and uh, German um, presidents and, uh, and chancellors that had been extremely close and were not able to move even an inch on nuclear issues. And then we had others that were not so close uh, where perhaps uh, it would have been in hindsight possible to achieve something in the nuclear realm. I think that Germany has it in its DNA, in its political DNA, to stay away from its own nuclear weapons. But I would not exclude the possibility um, that perhaps in such an uncertain future, as you described it, um, there might be in the future German politicians that would uh, re-enter a more serious dialogue with the French, but under the condition that then they would talk about a European deterrent, meaning uh, a, a nuclear deterrent for the entire European Union. And that's a totally different ball game. Again, that's not what Macron suggested. That's not what the French want. And, but then again, um, the circumstances uh, you sketched out, uh, Eliza, would perhaps be one where even the French uh, would be uh, willing to be a bit more forthcoming on some of those issues. But it's, it's a, it's a very um, unrealistic debate at the moment, I would say, but you never know. As I just said, um, we don't know who comes after Joe Biden. He just said he wants to be the next president. He would then be 81, could be. Uh, it could again be Donald Trump or someone much more radical or perhaps much more competent than Donald Trump was in pressuring European allies uh, on certain political uh, pain points. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kuhn, uh, for that prediction <laughs> or for those suggestions. Um, now, I don't see anybody's hands um, being raised. And I, I mean, we usually keep it um, to around this, uh, this period of time, so about 75 minutes, but sometimes if need be, we, we go beyond this. Uh, so I'll just um, launch a final call. If there are any questions, please do. Uh, don't be shy. Raise your hands and, and ask your questions. Um, well, uh, I can see that there are um, no more, at least nobody at this point may want to ask something, but they may um, 
they may follow up with you over email. And uh, I'm, I would like to, to extend my deepest thanks for uh, your kind acceptance of our invitation and for your very interesting, very uh, illuminating talk today. And we really do hope to host you here in person in the not too distant future. We wish you all the best with your research and I look forward to the edited volume. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It was a pleasure uh, joining you and uh, you all uh, have a, a wonderful rest of your day and of your week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay safe. Have a nice day. Take care.